Yeah, so I'm co a, the coordinator of the research project Tales of Things, so it means I'm not an academic and instead of spending my time in a dark room thinking about things, I'm the one that actually goes out to the public and, you know, um, shows them, well, try, hopefully makes the research more understandable. Um, and also get involved in quite a lot, of, a lot of interesting projects, and a couple of which I'll go through um, today, including the, the Shelf Life project. Um, the project is funded through the Digital Economy um, section of the Research Council, so it does have quite a technology focus. Um, but I'm going to be focusing more today on the social aspects because that's what I'm more interested in. Um, the the project is a collaboration between four univers four other universities. Um, all of which are listed here. And the basis of the research really started with the concept of the Internet of Things. And some of you, you know, may well be aware of um, what that is, but just in case, um, I'm just going to show you a short clip of this. Um, it's actually a promotional video made by IBM, but it explains the Internet of Things <coughs> better than I can. So <coughs> play that here. Oh, me do not found. No, now I'll have to tell you about it. <laughs> um, well, it's basically an idea, you know, for the future where everything, all new objects in the world will be connected and part of a larger network. Um, so, for example, you know, there's, well, in here, you know, there'll be temperature sensors, um, you know, and we've all got oyster, well, not all, but some of us have got oyster cards, you know, with RFID <laughs> technology in it, so you can, you know, be tracked wherever you are in the world. Um, so it's the idea in the future that, objects will have their own form of intelligence um, and that you'll be able to track them you know, through space and time. And Marks and Spencers use it a lot in manufacturing and logistical, logistical processes. Um, for instance, with a, a bag of prawns, they put an RFID tag on that and they, they can track exactly where it is at any given time and also the temperature that it's at and you know, lots of boring things like that. <laughs> and Bruce Sterling, um, has done quite a lot of work in this area and in his book um, Shaping Things he talks about spimes which are objects that can be tracked through space and time and throughout their lifetime. Spimes are regarded as material instantations of an Im immaterial system. They're virtual objects first and actual objects second which begin and end as data. So what the research team were concerned about, you know, if all these new objects in the world are going to be tagged, what about the old ones? Um, what's going to happen to them? You know, are they just going to be forgotten about and thrown away? And it's been suggested that people have between 1,000 and 5,000 objects, um, you know, so it's no small task. So the project, first of all, one of the aims um, is to find a new way of preserving social history. Um, and we did this through creating the website, talesofthings.com, which was launched in April 2010. And basically we try and, uh, well, users... Um, can add their, their own objects to the site by, you know, signing up, creating a username and password, and then they just simply photograph their object, upload it with a brief description, and then you can add a video or audio clip to it. And then once you've done that, you've then got the ability to print out a QR code, or you can also use RFID tags. Um, so it's hoping, you know, a way of future generations having a greater understanding of the object's past and the project also offers um, you know, an opportunity for you to place more value on the objects that you already have as part of your life, um, especially in an increasingly disposable economy. You know, it's hoped you'll think twice before throwing something away or maybe you know, your family and friends could find a new use for it. And it's also no secret you know, the power of the objects have you know, to evoke past lives and loves. Um, and in order to get this research out to the public, we've um, worked with a variety of different partners. Um, and we've worked with community groups. Um, so we did projects for Black History Month um, and Battle of Britain, and also tagged buildings as part of the London Festival of Architecture. And we've even tagged 4,000 bus stops in Norway. Um, and, yeah, and then going back to one of our main partners, Oxfam, um, you know, which I've already mentioned as part of the Future Everything Festival in Manchester a couple of years ago. Every time somebody went to an Oxfam shop with um, an object, they were, you know, encouraged to add a story to it. And we collected these as audio files and put QR um, sticker on them and also an RFID tag. And we had special RFID scanners made. 
to them and somebody went into the shop you know and saw an object with one of these tags they um, scanned it with a special reader and that would trigger speakers in the shop to you know play the object's stories to um, you know providing ghosts or um, you know people's memories through the speakers and every item that had been tagged um, in that store sold and they found that um, their sales for that you know, during the festival went up by 43% and it consistently, you know, stayed afterwards. So it shows you, you know, the value that objects, um, sorry, the value that memories um, can add to an object. And so, yeah, just a few weeks ago, we launched Oxfam Shelf Life. So we've now created a, a bespoke um, website for them and we've also got an iPhone app and it's happening in 10 stores in Manchester at the moment. Um, and again, you can go to one of these 10 stores in Manchester, pick up some blank tags and then add your own stories at home. And obviously we hope this is successful and then, you know, because it would be amazing if it could roll out nationally, you know, and just the fact it could change the face of the British High Street, which would be great. Um, and another project we did with Oxfam was as part of their curiosity shop in um, Selfridges in London. And I've taken along one of these dresses um, that were for sale in the shop and try and do a, a live demo. I didn't actually check the reception. Um, I think I might be all right. And yeah, so funnily enough, our app's called Tales of Things and I've just basically got a giant iPhone to show you here. So this is the lovely dress. And if I just, if it's light enough. Oh, this is where it all goes wrong. Can I get it? Here we are. So now it's revealed that um, Annie Lennox actually used to own this dress. And if I click play, you won't be able to hear it because unfortunately I've forgotten the speakers. <laughs> Hi, I'm Annie Lennox. You can hear it. And I'm it. donating this rather interesting, fabulous, unique dress, which I actually wore to a rather splendid occasion, which happened to be Nelson Mandela's 19th. Hyde Park in London. See, I don't know if you Bye. could all hear that at the back, but yeah, this was um, Annie Lennox's lovely dress, which she wore to Nelson Mandela's birthday party. Um, and this is, it's just a Ted Baker dress, so it's nothing too exciting. And Oxfam said that they'd normally sell this for £30, but because it had the memory attached for it, it actually sold for 175 So yeah, they're taking advantage there. It's great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Oxfam have really provided us with, you know, a great opportunity to highlight the potential of the Internet of Social Things, which is a term that's probably more appropriate because although, you know, lots of people were using the Tales of Things site, it was really just becoming you know, like another version of YouTube with, you know, lots of objects there and people could go and watch the videos. But, you know, the project's all about the actual objects um, and utilising them. So, yeah, Oxfam's provided us with you know, the chance to make it again be about the objects and moving away from the internet being, you know, just a desktop um, based platform, you know, um, it's giving the objects themselves the intelligence to be able to talk um, rather than having to look anything up on the internet. Um, so it's creating an object, uh, sorry, an environment where objects are becoming the agents themselves. It's just, you know, just the thought of walking into a charity shop in 20 years' time, you know, and if, if everything's been tagged with its own memory, you know, it's offering a new form of social history museum um, as well. And going back to Bruce Sterling's idea of spines, you know, you can also have more practical data on it, you know, like if this object doesn't deal well in direct sunlight, you know, please move me away if it gets too hot. Or, um, and our next, well not our next, but our next major um, partner we work with are museums, which is you know quite an obvious choice with thousands of interesting objects available. And the project I worked on was with the National Museum of Scotland and they gave us, a, us their Scotland A Changing Nation gallery. And this gallery um, looks at the history of Scotland in the 20th and 21st centuries. And the earliest object in the galleries uh, from World War I so most objects are actually within people's living memory, which is a you know, really important factor for us since the, the main point of our app is your ability to write back onto it. So we needed you know, people with some memories. 
Um, so we tagged 81 objects in the gallery from you know quite a wide variety of objects. So we've got the Hillman motor car there, iPod, train spotting poster, rotary dial telephone. Um, and on each of these codes, we attached unique footage. We had films from the Scottish Screen Archive, um, images from Scran, and through to interviews and publicity material um, as well. So the aims of the project were twofold. Um, you know, first of all, to offer unique interpretations on the museum objects, and secondly, um, you know, to encourage people to add their own stories um, and extend the museum's collection through a growing archive of personal stories. Um, and I'll just show you a really short clip of the sorts of films um, that were made. I'll just put the volume down on that one. Um, so yeah, that shows you the vase in the gallery. Feel free to scan the code. And this isn't the most exciting film, but I've included it because it shows a mix of archive footage, um, archive images, and then a film which shows you how they actually made the glass as well. And all the clips were just one to two minutes long because that was seen as you know the optimum concentration time for people um, viewing things on their phone. And we, along with this, we also organised you know a series of events to introduce the public to the concept um, and also to you know gather the all important memories. Um, so the, we launched the project in April two thousand and eleven as part of the Edinburgh International Science Festival, and that's the museum there up in Edinburgh and what we did was we had a, a memory booth basically a white shed um, which contained a video camera in it and then we forced kids to go in there no it was fine they, they, they signed a form they loved it um, and we chose six objects um, which related to objects up in the gallery itself but with these objects you can see we painted them white so we took rid of any brand associations or specific details so in the end, you know, it wasn't actually a, you know, the phone itself. It was a, a host, a host for memories. Um, and visitors were encouraged to, you know, leave their memories onto these white objects. That when people scanned one of the codes up in the gallery itself, you know, they'd not only get the curator's official information, but also see, you know, the, all these uh, video stories that we'd recorded as well. And we recorded quite a variety of different stories. Some. You know, quite personal, some historical, yeah, some pretty random ones. Um, and I'll show you an example of a couple here. This one, quite like. Hi, the Singer sewing machine. I used to live in Glasgow, and I remember people telling me that the Singer sewing machine factory, when the bell went at the end of the day, tens of thousands of people coming out, which you just wouldn't see nowadays anywhere. But my own Singer sewing machine story is when I was four, my mum had a Singer sewing machine with a pedal drive to make the wheel go round, and she once sewed through her finger, and I had to wind it backwards to get the needle and the thread out, and it was horrible. Uh, okay, thank you. So yeah, a good combo of bit of history and then gruesomeness, always good. <laughs> um, and when we first started, you know, recording these stories, I was quite concerned about, you know, the the stories being on message, you know, because we're part of the National Museum, and um, you know, I was quite worried about the, what the curators would think. But actually, they were, you know, quite relaxed about it, and you know, enjoyed the the variety um, of things here. And I've just taken an example of one of our white objects, um, and this represented a pair of dancing shoes up in the gallery um, to represent Edinburgh in the 1950s and, you know, going to the dance halls and um, writing out your dance cards. Um, and, yeah, we, one girl went into the video booth and took it completely differently. Dancing queen, young and She gets better. <laughs> You, get, you can download that on YouTube afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, w what was really nice about this though was, you know, she was so excited about it because just, you know, a few minutes later she went upstairs uh, to the gallery with her mum and then could scan the code and then, you know, immediately her video was attached to, you know, the one in the museum so she'd become part of the museum's collection. Um, although, you know, it does offer up, you know, some discussions and object noise and, you know, do we really want all this extra information you know and do visitors really want to listen to her saying but I hope they do you know <laughs> um, and in addition to this drop-in lunch we also held more focus workshops where we invited the public to take in 
um, objects from their homes which related to those in the gallery. Um, so the aim here was to create a you know a museum without walls because they were on the Tales of Things site in the museum group. Um, so there was a virtual connection between you know people's everyday objects, you know like their own dancing shoes, and those held in the museum collection to show that their you know their objects were just as important as those in the museum itself. And the final set of events we ran were part of um, BBC Hands On History. Um, and here we selected 16 films from the Scottish Screen Archive which had been shown upstairs. Um, but this was an opportunity for people to view the films you know, in full and on a large screen in the auditorium. And we also created a, a handout with obviously QR codes on it again. Um, so that p when people were sitting in the auditorium watching the films, you know, they could be scanning the codes and interacting with the gallery um, upstairs. And we were also on hand outside the auditorium um, to collect, you know, more visitor feedback. And we um, collected a number of audio files. And these files were then used um, in a performance in the Sunday evening called The Memory Mix. And here we hired a DJ to, um, we'd selected six films and the DJ mixed people's memories on top of um, on top of the films, so they felt like they were part of a performance and created an orchestra of voices. And I'll just show you. I'm not a DJ, so I'm not going to mix it in. I'm just going to play a short clip of one of um, one audio piece on top of it. Right. Yeah, thinking about. Yeah. Trying to get the film to play at the same time. Is it going to play at the same time? No. Yeah. Oh, it's ruined. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know if the film's going to work. Right. Yeah, I think about domestic style. Well, the, the film, you know, is from the 1930s and shows um, young kids in a school getting taught how to make dra dressmaking. I'll stop that there because I'm running out of time. But it gives you the general idea. Just with <laughs> imagine it was in motion, it was great. Um, so we tried to create a new form of oral history, really, which was participant-led um, rather than museum and interview-led. Um, so rather than trying to, you know, coax memories out of people by, you know, asking them questions, we put the objects in their hands so that then the objects start to do the talking for them. And then just to summarise, going back briefly to our blank objects in the museum. Um, Richard Coyne, someone who worked with at Edinburgh University, makes a clear distinction between objects and things and quotes Heidegger, um, the old German word thing means a gathering and specifically a gathering to deliberate on a matter under discussion, a contested matter. Um, so it's the idea that things aren't really objects at all, um, that but are points for conversation. For instance, with their museum things, you know, they had many different voices on them from the you know, the official curators to people with first-hand experiences. And, you know, museum objects are often contested anyway, but this, you know, technology offers a platform for this. And the internet anyway is all about stories and narratives, even if it's just a visual story in Pinterest. Um, but, of course, it's the, you know, the people that make the internet and the technology is just the facilitator. And that's it. 35 over, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot.